can a relatively affordable compact convertible be genuinely, heart-stoppingly, aspirationally desirable? Audi thinks so, and in the form of their second generation A3 Cabriolet, has bought us an open top car that's an enormous improvement on its predecessor. All the Audi attributes you're used to, cool design, fantastic build quality, engine efficiency and strong residual values, are at last matched to sleek looks, delivering that want one factor. You can't really ask for much more from a compact convertible. I've always found it puzzling that car manufacturers frequently pursue an idea obviously flawed from the outset. Perhaps they get a bit mired in the details and lose sight of the bigger picture. Sports cars that don't handle. That worked really well for TVR, didn't it? Economy-minded electric cars that cost three times as much as a diesel model. You know who I'm talking about. Or how about convertible cars that just don't look very elegant? That last trap is one Audi blundered into with its original A3 Cabriolet, but one firmly rectified by this, its second generation replacement. To be fair, there wasn't much else wrong with that original drop top A3, a car we first saw in 2007. It was well built, had a range of great engines to choose from and made all sorts of sense on the balance sheet thanks to decent efficiency and strong resale values. The problem lay in its underpinnings which had to be based on those of the A3 hatch, hence the short stubby shape and pram like look when the roof was down. BMW knew not to do this, basing the Audi's closest rival, their 1 Series convertible, on a coupe platform for a sleeker, more elegant look. So the Ingolstadt engineers went back to the drawing board, resulting in this second generation version, a car we first saw in the spring of 2014, and a design clearly based on a very different approach. For a start, it's now spun off the chassis of the A3 Saloon, rather than the hatchback, which means that it's both longer and lower than the model it replaces. In other words, it's a proper base for a smartly styled cabriolet conversion. Perhaps indeed the car to suit owners of the long-lamented A4 cabriolet, who can't stretch to its A5 replacement and certainly an Audi guaranteed to tempt buyers in search of something just a touch nicer than mainstream family hatch-based compact convertibles can offer. Time to put it to the test. In theory, the first question you should ask when looking at a convertible should relate to how the chassis copes with having the roof chopped off. Some don't manage very well, the rear view mirror getting the shakes as soon as you set off down the road and encounter a few bumps. Think of a shoebox and how much less rigid it is once you take the top off. Unless, of course, you strengthen the base and the sides. It's the same with a car, but strengthening adds weight, which equals stodgy handling and high running costs. So compromises are made and we're back to wobbly rear view mirrors and chassis setups that flex all over the place with the vagaries of the road surface. Compromises of course aren't the Audi way, Volsprung der Technik and all that, but even their engineers had to scratch their heads over this one. Large luxury convertibles with their heavier weight are easier to sort out in this regard, but small drop tops are notoriously difficult to get right. It was fortunate then for Ingolstadt that in developing this car they had access to the Volkswagen Group's high-tech MQB platform that all this conglomerate's modern era products are based upon, stiffer, lighter and better. This second generation A3 Cabriolet would see its use in a convertible model for the very first time, a real test. But one the technology seems well equipped to meet. Now I'd be lying if I said there was no shake or shudder at all with this car over poor road services, but there really isn't very much. Especially if, at point of purchase, you make the right suspension choice between firm, firmer or firmest. Or to put it in Audi speak, the standard sports or S-line sports suspension setups that your dealer will offer you. Get this wrong and you run the risk of spoiling the 
cosseting, luxurious character of this car in pursuit of dynamic attributes it was never really designed to prioritise. The Sport setup is lowered by 15mm, the Eslan Sports by a further 10mm. Neither is a very pleasant companion on a poorly surfaced road, so if you're going for a test drive in this car, make sure you ask the salesperson which setup is fitted to the car you're driving. If they don't know, then you'd probably be better off with someone who understands the product a little better sat beside you. My opinion on this issue, for what it's worth, is pretty straightforward. Go for the standard suspension setup. It's an option even on the sportiest S-Line trim models. Then, if you have the extra cash, also tick the box for the optional Audi magnetic ride system. Uh, with its clever magneto rheological fluid filled dampers. Now these enable you to set the ride quality up to suit the road that you're on and the mood that you're in, rather than having it set permanently firm. After all, it's hard to look cool when your fillings are being shaken loose. Magnetic Ride operates through the functionality of the Audi Drive Select driving dynamic system that's standard on all but base trim models. It's the kind of setup that you might be getting familiar with by now on premium cars, enabling you at the touch of a button to alter steering, throttle and gear change responses to suit relaxed, performance orientated or efficiency prioritised styles of driving. For me, adding the extra cost suspension element to the equation properly completes the package. By the way, Drive Select operates with a touch of this dash mounted button here prior to your selection between the various self-explanatory settings. Mostly you'll be switching between comfort, dynamic and efficiency, but there's also an auto option if you can't make up your mind and an individual setting enabling you to bespoke some of the modes to your personal preferences once you've spent an hour or so with your head buried in the owner's manual. With all this sorted you can really start to enjoy this Audi. As I've already suggested, it's not really supposed to be any sort of sports car, but that doesn't mean that once you've got over the slight vagueness of the steering, you can't have fun in it. Enjoyment of this kind is possible because this car is so good through the corners, thanks to a front end endowed with prodigious levels of grip. There's a quattro four-wheel drive option on top models, but in the dry, I can't see that you'd need it. I think twice about the S-Tronic twin clutch auto transmission too, unless I really was urban bound. First because on the diesel models most we'll be looking at, it's the relatively inefficient six speed system. And second because the stick shift model is already so good, the pedal placing's perfect and the change action light and direct. As for the convertible issues, well as you can see, roof down, buffeting for front seat folk isn't much of an issue and won't be on the motorway unless you really are venturing up to autobahn speeds. Inevitably, as in all cabrios, it'd be a different question for those sat in the rear. Of course, you can't have anyone sat in the rear if you fit the rather inelegant wind deflector which sits across the back passenger compartment and leaves you with only two seats. It's still worth having though for serene, unruffled progress, the kind of thing you certainly get when driving with the roof up. As you can see, as with most modern cabriolets, the mechanism's operable on the move at speeds of up to 31 miles an hour. And once the roof's up, there really isn't much more road noise than you get in a fixed top A3. Certainly not more than you'd get roof up in one of those folding metal topped convertibles. This is all provided that you order your A3 Cabriolet with what the brand calls an acoustic roof. It's an extra cost item on base trim models but very well worth having, with an extra layer of foam inserted between the hood's three fabric layers that improves cabin refinement by 30%. On to engines. Many will want to avoid the entry level units, a 125 PS 1.4 litre TFSI petrol and a 105 PS 1.6 litre TDI diesel, in favour of the two power plants that make up the heart of the range. The most obvious choice is the one most buyers will probably make, the 150 PS 2 litre TDI diesel that I'm trying here. 
and sure enough it's a very impressive engine with eager pulling power delivering the rest of 62 miles an hour sprint in 8.9 seconds en route to a 139 miles an hour maximum that ought to be enough for anyone. Personally though, if I were buying this car, I'd take the other mainstream option, a 140 PS version of the 1.4 litre TFSI petrol unit with clever COD or cylinder on demand technology. It's almost as efficient as the diesel, significantly quieter, especially of course with the roof down, and just as quick. 62 miles an hour from rest takes 9.1 seconds en route to 135 miles an hour. I'm not sure I'd really want to go much faster than that in this car, but Audi centres are ready and willing to oblige those with a further need for speed. Diesel folk get a Pokia 184 PS version of the 2 litre TDI unit, while those preferring petrol have the further option of a 180 PS 1.8 litre TFSI power plant, the engine you have to have if you're looking for a mainstream petrol powered A3 cabriolet with the option of quattro four wheel drive. This variant also gets a slicker seven speed S-Tronic auto transmission setup than diesel drivers can have. Uh, and with this fitted, 62 miles an hour is just 7.8 seconds away en route to 150 miles an hour. The same system is also an option on the ritziest version of this car you can buy, the potent S3 flagship model, which mates quattro four-wheel drive to a 300 PS 2.0-litre TFSI turbo petrol engine able to power you to 62 miles an hour in just 5.4 seconds on the way to 155 miles an hour. Toupees will very definitely need to be firmly tied down. If you were familiar with the first generation A3 Cabriolet, you'll find this Mark II model a far more elegant thing. The original was based on the A3 hatchback body shell, which perhaps inevitably led to somewhat dumpy pram-like styling. This car, in contrast, is built on a modified version of the longer chassis used by the A3 Saloon, and as a result is 183 millimeters longer, 28 millimeters wider, and 15 millimeters lower than its predecessor. You'll find it classier too. Take the lovely satin metallic finish of this windscreen header rail, part of a whole range of beautiful detailing that carries on around the waistline to the neat rear tonneau cover. It's all made quite a difference, giving the impression of a far more desirable, far more substantial car and one that you'd be far happier to move into if you were downsizing from a larger convertible. As well as the dimensional changes, Audi's designers have employed virtually every trick in the book to accentuate the longer, wider, lower look with more shape in the doors and a strong so-called tornado swage line that runs from the tail-like cluster all the way forward to the wedgy front headlights that flank the usual classy single frame radiator grille. The previously flat waistline is now carried up at the rear too, offering a squat, power packed impression. As a result of all this, we've ended up with a much more dynamic looking car, even without the sports suspension that can drop it up to 25 millimeters lower to the ground. More important though is what you can't see, the high-tech MQB modular transverse platform that underpins the ultra lightweight construction primarily responsible for the kind of weight saving that sees this car up to 60 kilograms lighter than its predecessor. But of course almost any cabriolet looks good roofed down, how will it be top up? Like every convertible Audi, this one's hood is made of cloth and in this case opens or closes in 18 seconds and you can do it at speeds of up to 31 miles an hour. It's quite sleek for a compact convertible with a nice touch being the way that the rear section has been sculpted to mirror the shape of the saloon. Of course it's quite tempting to dismiss cloth-topped cabrios as being technically inferior to 
scaffolding metal roofed models. But there's plenty of high tech on offer here with magnesium used in the large roof peak, while the parts that give the roof its shape are fashioned from aluminium. The hood itself has three layers and a headliner and on plusher models like this one is supplied in acoustic form with a layer of foam inserted that's supposed to reduce cabin noise levels by around 30%. The idea of that is to offer all the refinement a folding metal roof would provide without the boot space compromises that approach entails. Has Audi managed that? Yes. The boot certainly isn't massive and bulkier baby buggies will be tough to fit in the rather odd shaped space when the roof's down and you've just 275 litres to play with. But the 320 litres you get as here with the roof up is substantial in comparison to what you get from a folding metal top model like BMW's 4 Series convertible for example, which is supposed to be a much larger car, yet which offers you 100 litres less. More directly competitive fabric top cabriolets can't match the carriage capacity of this one either. A Golf Cabriolet offers 70 litres less, a Vauxhall Cascada 50 litres less. As with these cars, there's the option to extend the luggage space on offer by pushing forward the 50-50 split folding rear bench uh, with these latches, a process that in this case frees up 678 litres of total fresh air. Of course, whenever you find a compact cabriolet with a reasonably sized boot, there's always the fear that rear seat passengers will be compromised as a result. Is that the case here? Well, yes and no. It certainly isn't what you'd call spacious back here, but then no car in this class is. What's undeniable though is that basing this second generation design on a longer wheelbase has freed up a little more space for knees, shoulders and legs. It also helps that the two main seating positions are sculpted into a comfy shape. Now true, this is still an environment best suited to kids and shopping bags, and I certainly wouldn't want to be trying to lug a heavy child seat in and out when the roof was up. But that said, we're now no longer talking about rear seat bursts. You'd be embarrassed to point adults towards for short journeys. Time though to get to the part of this car Audi does really well the front of the cabin. Quite simply, nothing else in this segment can match it. The interior, as in all A3s, dominated by an electrically extending 5.8 inch color screen, centrally positioned on top of the dash. Via this, you can marshal the many functions of a redesigned MMI infotainment system that prevents all but the most vital controls from cluttering up the minimalist dashboard. Just as distinctive are the four air vents, styled to look like miniature jet engines and made up of no fewer than 30 individual parts, including bright metal outer rings that are shaped for perfect grip. Otherwise, you have an interior that'll be familiar fare to anyone who speaks fluent Audi design language. Everything clear, classy and easily accessible. Only the thick windscreen pillars represent any sort of departure from the usual A3 feel, beefed up to withstand a rollover impact. This apart, it's just as you'd find in an A3 hatch or saloon. So the instrument panels styled in a wing-like profile and an electric parking brake replaces the traditional and preferable handbrake lever so as to free up space for an MMI infotainment system controller by your left hand that can now be ordered with a touchpad on top. Ultimately, what it all adds up to is a cabin that wouldn't be out of place on a car costing twice the price. And how many models of this kind can you say that about exactly? Expect to pay somewhere in the 26 to 36,000 pound bracket for your A3 Cabriolet. So as expected, you're talking a bracket above mainstream family hatchback based Cabriolets like Renault's Megane CC or Peugeot's 308 CC. Cars that sell in the 20 to 25,000 pound segment. 
Now, as you might expect, many A3 Cabriolet buyers are going to be browsing at the bottom end of the pricing spectrum, where most will want to step up beyond the base petrol and diesel units to the two engines the majority of buyers in this country select, either the 1.4 litre TFSI COD petrol model or the 2 litre TDI 150 diesel. The TDI carries a £1,500 premium. I'd consider that question carefully if I were you. It's easy to simply tick the box for a diesel without realising that with cylinder on demand technology the petrol variant is nearly as efficient and of course runs on cheaper fuel. Further up the range you'll need a budget from £30,000 upwards for the extra poke of the 1.8 litre TFSI petrol power plant though at least that figure includes the S-Tronic automatic gearbox that's a £1,500 option on the entry-level engines. At this point, Audi introduces the option of Quattro four-wheel drive for a £1,500 premium, a feature that, as you might expect, is standard if you can stretch to around £36,000 for the flagship 300 PS 2-litre petrol turbocharged S3 model. Many potential A3 Cabriolet buyers are going to be attracted to this car as a far more affordable and more efficient route into convertible Audi motoring than the larger A5 Cabrio can offer. Compare the two cars together in 1.8 litre petrol form and the A3 offers a saving of around £3,000. But in 2 litre diesel guys that saving can rise to as much as £6,000. As for premium badge similarly priced rivals, well, there aren't many. Probably the closest alternative being BMW's similarly priced 2 Series convertible. Vauxhall's Cascada is similar money too, but it's less efficient, slower, will depreciate faster and has a smaller boot. If you want to spend a little less, then Volkswagen's Golf Cabriolet might be an option, but that's an older design that also has less cargo space and higher running costs and doesn't really offer much of a price saving. Personally, I'd prefer Volkswagen's other rag top, the Beetle Cabriolet, as an alternative, but it's less practical, less dynamic and again not that much cheaper if you properly match both engine and spec against this Audi. With such little direct opposition to face down, there's no reason to suppose that this second generation A3 Cabriolet won't sell in prodigious numbers. But just to make sure, Audi has included a pretty generous kit list across the range. Though base trimmed variants do without the triple lined acoustic roof and Audi Drive Select vehicle dynamic system that many customers would prefer to have, most of the other items you'd expect are provided, including alloy wheels of at least 16 inches in size, that powered roof, a body coloured roof spoiler, uh, front fog lights, auto headlamps and wipers, heated door mirrors, air conditioning, a driver information system with onboard computer and a leather trimmed multifunction steering wheel. There's also the electrically extending 5.8 inch MMI infotainment screen via which you can Bluetooth link in your phone plus iPods, iPhones, USB storage media and MP3 players. And from here you'll also be controlling an 8 speaker stereo system complete with DAB radio. The acoustic roof and the drive select vehicle dynamic system that I just mentioned are standard from mid-spec sport trim upwards along with larger 17 inch wheels, uh, front sport seats, dual zone climate control and some aluminium highlights. Top S-Line spec buys you 18 inch alloys, cloth and leather trim for the upholstery, a body kit and Xenon Plus headlights. Now, the Top Sport and S-Line models get the no-cost option of the two stiffer sport suspension settings, but perhaps the ideal suspension package is the magnetic ride damping system, which for another £800 or so enables you to set the ride of the car to suit the mood that you're in or the road that you're on via the usual selections on the Drive Select setup. As for options, well, I always find it a little frustrating on cabriolets to find that a wind deflector cost extra. If you're going to buy this kind of car, why would you not want that? Here it comes as part of a 
comfort package that also gives you an auto dimming rear view mirror and cruise control as well as the rear parking sensors that really are essential given the restricted hood up rearward visibility of this Audi. For me another optional must have would be the active seat ventilation system that you can set to blow a lovely stream of warm air onto your neck. That'll be a godsend roof down on a cold morning. And beyond that well, there are optional alloy wheels of up to 19 inches in size if you really want to ruin the ride quality of your car. And full leather trim won't cost you an exorbitant amount. The park assist setup will steer you into the tightest space and a ski and snowboard bag might be useful if you're a regular on the slopes. More useful day to day, of course, will be satellite navigation, a feature which is at last reasonably priced on an Audi, around £500, enough to get it built into the MMI display screen. I'd also be tempted by some of the options fitted to the car I've got here. An interior lighting package that makes you feel very special indeed when it gets dark, heated front seats, an upgraded Audi sound system and a storage and luggage package that helps you make better use of the restricted boot space. I also especially like the Xenon Plus adaptive headlamps that I mentioned earlier. Now these can automatically dip themselves at night, uh, can adapt themselves to the kind of road that you're driving on and can even use sat-nav data to predict the kind of beam that will be necessary once you turn the next corner. If you want to go further, the optional LED headlights are even cleverer. And all of that is before you get to the particularly clever electronic connectivity options that really do set this car apart. The Audi Connect system lets the driver network with the internet and with other vehicles and its central component is what Audi calls mobile phone preparation. With this, you can turn your A3 into a WLAN or wireless local area network hotspot so that you can surf the internet and email with up to eight mobile devices. This also brings into play features such as navigation with images from Google Earth, a Google points of interest search function with voice control and a web radio setup so that you can tune into stations around the world. There's also a clever Audi online traffic information system that uses live traffic information to reroute you around jams. Truly, this is motoring in the 21st century. Safety-wise, the A3 Cabriolet gets an active rollover protection system with these two spring-loaded plates recessed into the body to protect occupants in case of a rollover accident. Otherwise, all the usual five-star Euro NCAP standard A3 safety features are in evidence, including twin front side and head airbags, plus a knee bag for the driver, Isofix child seat fastenings, an active bonnet designed to reduce pedestrian injuries, plus ESP stability control and adaptive brake lights that flash during emergency stops to warn following motorists. There's also driver rest recommendation technology that assesses your driving style and shows a warning if it detects a decline in attentiveness, prompting you to stop for a restorative coffee. Beyond that, there is of course plenty of optional safety technology. I particularly like the ACC adaptive cruise control system which works at up to 124 miles an hour and is capable of bringing the car to a complete stop then automatically pulling it away again if necessary. You can also build into this setup the even smarter PreSense front system. This uses a radar sensor at the top of the windscreen to constantly scan the road ahead for potential collision risks warning the driver if one is detected and, if necessary, even automatically braking the car to respond if you're travelling below 19 miles an hour. The PreSense technology is also available in a more basic guise that will automatically tension the front seat belts and close both the windows if the ESP system indicates that the car is about to skid. Other neat optional touches include a traffic sign detection setup that pictures speed signs as you pass and displays them on the dash, and a park assist system that can automatically steer you into spaces. Now, beyond that, there's also Audi side assist, 
to stop you dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot and Audi Active Lane Assist which stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway. The weight saving of up to 60 kilograms that Audi engineers have achieved with this second generation A3 Cabriolet is notable and all the more so given that this is a better performing and more spacious car. The basic convertible top weighs only 50 kilograms. So this model starts off with a useful head start when it comes to running cost returns. An advantage which can be added into the existing efficiency initiatives you'd now expect from a car of this kind. These include a stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights, and a host of other little detail touches, like brake energy recuperation, which recycles energy you'd otherwise lose when braking or cruising. Then there's a climate control system that can be used in a highly economic eco mode. The efficiency setting you can choose on the Drive Select Vehicle Dynamics system. An efficiency program that you'll find on the onboard computer that gives you fuel saving tips. A gear shift indicator and a sleek drag coefficient of just 0.30 CD. It's also worth pointing out that at the end of its life, nearly all of this car can be recycled. But let's get to the figures. The most frugal variant, predictably, is the 1.6 litre TDI diesel version that manages over 70 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle, along with a CO2 return only fractionally over the 100 grams per kilometre of CO2 mark. The variant I'm trying here, the 150 PS 2 litre TDI diesel, is only a little behind that, delivering 67.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 110 grams per kilometre of CO2. If this is the version you have in mind, I'd suggest that you don't sign on the dotted line before first checking out the comparably priced and very clever 140 PS 1.4 litre TFSI COD petrol model. Here, high-tech cylinder-on-demand technology sees this four-cylinder engine running on only two of its cylinders at low to mid-throttle speeds. Thanks to that, this variant manages a combined cycle figure within spitting distance of that of a TDI, 56.5 miles to the gallon and 114 grams per kilometre. And the petrol model gets even closer to the running cost returns of its diesel counterpart should you opt for automatic transmission, thanks to its use of a more efficient 7-speed gearbox. The TDI gets an older, dirtier 6-speeder. As a result, a 1.4 TSI COD S-Tronic variant returns 57.6 miles to the gallon and 114 grams per kilometre, while a 2-litre TDI S-Tronic delivers 60.1 miles to the gallon and a smokier 122 grams per kilometre of CO2. Still want that diesel? Moving further up the range, petrol folk may be looking at the 180 PS 1.8 TFSI variant, which manages 48.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 133 grams per kilometre of CO2 when matched with S-Tronic automatic transmission. Mind you, order that same car with quattro four-wheel drive and the returns drop quite markedly, falling to 42.8 miles to the gallon and 154 grams per kilometre. For the sake of completeness, I'll also give you the figures for the potent S3 flagship variant, 39.8 miles to the gallon and 165 grams per kilometre, returns that again are slightly improvable with the S-Tronic auto gearbox fitted, and pretty impressive for a 300 PS high performance cabriolet flyer. As a result of all this, overall running costs should be admirably low with the entry-level 1.4 litre car uh, with COD costing around 35 pence per mile over a typical three-year 60,000 mile ownership tenure. To put that number into perspective, the 2 litre TDI opens at about 38 pence per mile and the 1.8 petrol around 42 pence per mile. Whichever variant you choose, you're only looking at a handful of loose change more than it would cost to run a smaller, far less luxurious cabriolet like a mini roadster. As for residual values, well, independent specialist Cap Monitor 
reckon that for mainstream variants, these will be class leading. A fraction in front of BMW and far ahead of those of, say, a Volkswagen Golf Cabriolet. Buy, say, an A3 Cabriolet now, and three years down the road, it should still be worth between 39 and 44% of what you initially paid for it, depending on the variant that you choose. Believe it or not, that's not quite as high as the A3 Saloon, but it's still pretty good going, and beats the BMW 2 Series convertible by around 5 or 6 percentage points. These higher residuals are what makes it worth paying the extra for this car over, say, something comparable but more mainstream, like, for example, a well-equipped drop-top Renault Megane or Peugeot 308, cars that have closed the gap in terms of quality to this one in recent years. As long as you can afford the initial outlay and don't go mad on the options list, the Audi is probably going to work out cheaper to own in the long run. That's provided, as I've suggested, you get your spec right when initially specifying your car. Metallic paint, the triple lined hood with the extra foam, the acoustic one, the S-Tronic transmission, sat-nav and internet connectivity services are about the only extras you'll see money back on. Many buyers can take or leave leather trim on open top cars and bigger alloy wheels aren't to all buyers' tastes either on this class of car. Bear all that in mind before being tempted to go mad on Audi's seductive online configurator. Further running cost assistance is provided by a fixed price servicing plan that can cover you for three years or 30,000 miles for around £400. You can also extend the unremarkable three year 60,000 mile warranty to either four or five years at extra cost. Insurance groupings should be relatively affordable too. I'll pick out a few mainstream models to give you an idea, with the 1.4 litre petrol COD variant rated at Group 23, the diesel 2 litre rated at Group 25, and the petrol 1.8 at Group 29. It's hard to think of any car in Audi's recent history that's been improved so dramatically from one generation to the next as this A3 Cabriolet. You name it, it's better. Clever design, the way the car drives, practicality, running costs, equipment, everything's all a big step on. An observation which perhaps is truest when it comes to the way this thing looks. Where the original version was a convertible that seemed pretty good on paper, it just didn't have that essential element of desirability that marks a great open top car, too dumpy to really cut a dash. This Mark II model rectifies that. By any measure, it's a seriously handsome piece of styling, effectively turning the tables on its nearest BMW rival. Of course, it's always possible to spoil things, adding big wheels and firmer suspension options that ruin the ride quality, doing without the excellent acoustic roof that makes this car so refined, loading the car with pricey extras that won't pay for themselves come resale time. But all of these things are in your hands. Audi's job was to provide the market's most desirable compact convertible, and it's a task that's been completed with consummate skill. Provided you don't enter the purchasing process with unrealistic expectations that this model will be mainstream brand affordable or some sort of sports car, it's hard to see how you could be disappointed by what's on offer here. The A3 Cabriolet has matured, got a little more Vorsprung Dirk Technik, and the compact convertible class has a new benchmark.